Good morning, my dear students. Today we are going to discuss about a very important topic in biotechnology, and uh, that is what is called as biotechnology and its applications. See, biotechnology itself is an applied aspect of genetics. Okay, so when Johann Gregor Mendel formulated many laws of heredity, then at a later stage people came out with the structure of the DNA. When we had a complete, complete knowledge about the structure of the gene, then we entered into the arena of the manipulation of the genes either to modify the gene, or to delete a gene, or to add a gene, but anything, it is for the welfare of the human being. So, the biotechnology emerged as a separate subject all by itself. Biotechnology itself is only about a 20 year old subject. Okay. When we were students in our uh, UG and PG class, there was no biotechnology. We studied only genetics. And then, in, in 19, uh, I mean, in 1990, uh, somewhere round about that, biotechnology emerged as a separate subject. So, it has got its own principles, procedures, and then we have to study about the application of the biotechnology also. So, biotechnology could be applied for the welfare of the human being in which areas? That is our idea about uh, this class. When we apply biotechnology to the different organisms, what could be the organisms? It could be a plant, it could be an animal, it could be microorganism like a bacteria, virus, fungus, etc. Everything is coming under one umbrella of biotechnology. So, the application part of the biotechnology is rather very interesting and in what way the biotechnology has helped the human being to make his life happier, healthier is what we are going to study in this class. Biotechnology deals with industrial scale production of these are five areas we are going to discuss. One is pharma, biopharmaceuticals and biological materials. Both of them are related to the field of medicine. Then genetically modified organisms popularly called as GMO. Okay, fungi, but the large scale production of uh, different uh, antibiotics etc derived from fungi and then from the plant also you are getting so many products which are biologically or biotechnologically produced. Animals also form the source. So the large scale production of the things we apply in these areas, biopharmaceuticals and biological materials genetically modified uh, microbes or micro organisms, fungi, plants and animals. Now the application of a biotechnology includes therapeutics. Therapeutics means the therapeutic values, curing effect, diagnostics, diagnosis of uh, many diseases in the human being, diagnosis of uh, genetically disorder, genetic disorders in the developing fetus that we are able to diagnose today and then we are able to seek a remedial measure for that. Genetically modified crops for agriculture, then processed food, bioremediation, this particularly comes in the environmental biology, bioremediation, waste water treatment and then energy production in the ecology. So all these are different uh, areas in which biotechnology has spread its wings. 
Biotechnological application in agriculture. Now, one by one, we are going to take up the discussion. The first one is how biotechnology has improved the agriculture. The Green Revolution succeeded in tripling the food supply. Tripling, threefold the Green Revolution, which happened somewhere, it started somewhere in the year 1965 or Roughly about 1975. People realized that the food that we are having in our country is not sufficient enough to feed all the mouths. So we have to do something in this area. We have to improve the quantity of the food. That's what people thought. And so there emerged what is called as a green revolution on the plant side. White revolution and a blue revolution on the animal side. So this is the Green Revolution, it helped us to get threefold amount of food. But it but that even that threefold increase was not enough to feed the growing human population. Increased yield was due to improved crop varieties. We, we, we were able to improve the uh, crop varieties by different type of hybridization techniques, I mean acclimatization, introduction, so many techniques I have already told you. How, what are the different methods of uh, improving the crop varieties? All these measures we applied to bring about a green revolution. Better management practices, how much of water has to be given as an irrigation, how it has to be maintained, how to minimize the water uh, consumption in agriculture, what best uh, output could be got from the plants, then the agrochemicals, use of agrochemicals, fertilizers and pesticides. So in all these areas we were able to work very hard to bring about a green revolution, thereby able to increase the food supply threefold. But still, it was not enough. It is to that point I am coming now. So, naturally, we had to depend upon biotechnology, which uh, lend a helping hand to still improve the crop production to our to an unimaginable quantity. Okay. But Agrochemicals are often too expensive, not only too expensive, but it is also very injurious to the health. Chemicals are always injurious to the health. That is why after 40 years, and as I told you, the bio, I mean, green revolution, for the use of pesticides, then different type of insecticides, everything. We are using it for the last 40, 50 years. Now, once again, we have turned it to, once again, biological products. Bio manure, all these things. So these agrochemicals are not only too expensive, but also they are very much detrimental to our health. It increases the yield with the existing varieties. The understanding of genetics has helped us to obtain maximum yield from their fields by the application of biotechnology. That is what is called as applied biotechnology. So, by applying the biotechnological knowledge, we are able to get the maximum yield. Maximum yield means more than the green revolution. More than what we were getting between the year 1960 to 1990, when the biotechnology emerged as a separate subject. In this 30 years, this 30 years was uh, I mean, uh, 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 the period of uh, chemicals. We were using chemicals for our uh, I mean, uh, um, manure, chemical manure, then pesticides, insecticides, fungicides, for all these things, herbicides, for all these things we were using only chemicals during this period. And then in the year, somewhere in the year 1990, we turned our attention to biotechnology and how best biotechnology could uh, help, could uh, increase the yield of the crop. 
it is uh, to that aspect we were showing the attention. Plants, bacteria, fungi, and animals whose genes have been altered by manipulation are called genetically modified organisms, popularly called as GMOs. Genetically modified plants have been useful in many ways. Genetic modification has made crops more tolerant to abiotic stresses like cold, drought, salt and heat. See, this point is very important. Genetically modified crops are more tolerant to abiotic factors such as the cold, drought, salt and heat. Secondly, Number two, it helped to reduce the post-harvest losses. The, har the harvest loss uh, may be due to many insects, fungi and different organisms or uh, reasons. They are the reasons for these uh, losses. And we are able to reduce these uh, post-harvest losses by biotechnological processes. Increase the efficiency of a mineral usage when we are adding minerals to the plants, we may be adding it, but they, will, they should be able to absorb the minerals and then produce it in the form of the fruits, cereals, crops, seeds, etc. So how it happens? Only if it is having the best efficiency to use our minerals, to use the minerals that we are supplying then the plants will give the best result. So biotechnology has increased this efficiency of mineral usage. Biotechnology prevents the early exhaustion of fertility of a soil. When you are adding soil, chemicals to the soil, that's what we were doing for the last 40 years. It is losing its fertility, it is losing its potency. So, that is now being reduced by use of biotechnology. Enhanced nutritional value of a food, example, vitamin rich rice we have found out. To create tailor made plants to supply alternative resources to industries in the form of starches, fuels, and pharmaceuticals. See? This is what is called as uh, Bt cotton. Why it's called a Bt cotton? It's called Bt stands for Bacillus thuringiensis, the name of a bacteria. Okay. Now, what, why, in what way it is related to this uh, cotton is what we are going to see now. See, this is Bacillus thuringiensis. This is the uh, bacterium, and this is the Bt gene of Bacillus thuringiensis. Bt gene of the Bacillus thuringiensis. Now, when it is introduced, when this is introduced into the crop, when it is introduced into the crop, the worm which is feeding on this crop, normally it is, and you know, it's killed. The crop is infected by the European corn borer. That is the name of the worm. So, European corn borer. When this European corn borer is boring the corn plant, it normally kills it. The pest dies when it is feeding on the plant. That is how the gossypium plant is saved from this corn borers. So for this, well, which, well, from which source we have taken the help? It is from the Bacillus thuringiensis. It is a bacterium. So it is a, this a bacterium which is now saving the crop. So, pest resistant plants, Bt toxin is produced by 
the bacterium called Bacillus thuringiensis. So the Bacillus thuringiensis is producing a toxin and that toxin is called as Bacillus thuringiensis toxin. This toxin gene has been cloned from the bacteria and been expressed in plants to provide resistance to the insects without the need for the insecticide. So when you are using this Bt toxin, then you need not use any insecticide. This Bt gene, this Bt toxin gene is able to go into the corn plant and then there it is able to express in the plants. When it is getting expressed in the plants, it is able to kill the insects or it is able to provide a resistance to the insects. So examples are Bt cotton, Bt corn, rice, tomato, potato and soya beans. So these are all the examples. So the Bacillus thuringiensis has offered a very good uh, I mean, uh, technology for us. So when its genes are taken and then introduced into these uh, crops, the corn borers, and all these insects, we are able to resist the plant, the crop is able to resist all these uh, things. Bacillus thuringiensis. Bt cotton, some strains of Bacillus thuringiensis are produce proteins that kill certain insects such as. Now what this, uh, this uh, is doing, this Bacillus thuringiensis produces a proteins that kills the certain insects such as Lepidopterans, Lepidopterans which is a tobacco bud worm or what is called as an army worm. Then, Polypterans, which is called as a beetles, and uh, dipterans, which is called as the flies and mosquitoes. So, oh, these are these are the English names, and they are coming under these categories. So, these insects are being resisted or being killed by the Bacillus thuringiensis uh, poisonous gene. It forms a uh, protein crystals during a particular phase of their growth. These crystals, they contain a toxic substance called insecticidal proteins. So when these proteins go into the stomach, then automatically the insect dies. The Bt toxin protein exists as an inactive protoxin. Toxin. So it is a normally inactive. Once an insect ingest this inactive toxin, it is converted into its active form of a toxin due to the alkaline pH of the gut which solubilizes the crystals. So what happens once the crystals are formed? This activated toxin binds to the surface of the midgut epithelial cells and create pores that cause cell swelling and lysis, finally death and eventually cause the death of the insect. So when, this, when these insects are going and then feeding on the corn plant or rice plant or a cotton plant, whatever it is, these are prototoxin, prototoxins which are in its inactive form goes and then gets activated, gets converted into a crystal and then it is able to burst the gut cells. So the insect finally dies. So this is the way how Bacillus thuringiensis is able to save our plants. Specific Bt toxin genes were isolated from Bacillus thuringiensis and incorporated into the several crop plants such as cotton. The choice of genes depends upon the crop and the targeted pest as the most of the Bt toxins are insect group specific. So, which strain of which strain of a Bt Bacillus thuringiensis that you have to select, it all depends upon the crop. But generally, most of the crops 
they are saved by for beating toxins this toxin is coded by a gene named cri there are a number of them the proteins encoded by the genes are cri 1 ac cri 2 ab both of them are able to control the cotton bolo waves worms so cri 1 ac cri 2 ab they are able to control the cotton bolo worms then cri 1 ab controls the corn borer so these are the different genes these are the different genes pest resistant plants several nematodes parasitize paras parasitize for a wide variety of plants and the animals including human beings the nematode cladigynia incognita infects the roots of a tobacco plants and causes a great reduction in the yield a novel strategy was adopted to prevent this infestation based on the process of rna interference technology that is rna i rna i takes place in all eukaryotic organisms as a method of cellular defense so malady gynia in cognitive how what is this doing how it is infecting the plants is what we are going to see in the next few slides this is the worm see this is the worm this method involves silencing of a specific mrna due to a complementary double stranded rna molecule that binds to and prevents translation of the mrna that is it is a silencer this source of the source of this complementary rna is from an infection by viruses having rna genomes or mobile genetic elements called the transposons that replicate via an rna intermediate okay so then the method of involves silencing of a specific mrna due to a complementary double stranded rna when you have got a double stranded rna this double stranded rna a particular portion when an mrna has to be synthesized it is being silenced it is not able to this mrna is not able to be synthesized so it is a by that this process is achieved using agrobacterium vector nematode specific genes were introduced into the host plant the introduction of dna was such that it produced both sense and anti sense rna in the host cells these are two rnas being complementary to each other formed a double stranded rna that initiated rna initiating and thus silenced the specific mrna of the nematode see by using the agrobacterium vectors the nematode specific genes were introduced into the host plant so the agrobacterium Tinifacium, so uh, the genus is Agrobacterium. It could be any species. So these uh, bacteria, the nematode-specific genes were introduced into the host plant. Now the introduction has resulted. The introduction of a DNA was such that it produced both sense and anti-sense RNA in the host cells, that is, in the plant cells. these are two rnas being complemented to each other formed a double stranded rna that initiated rna i and thus silenced the specific mrna so how this mrna is being silenced in the nematode 
is uh, what we are discussing. So the consequence was that the parasite could not survive in the transgenic host expressing specific interfering RNA. The transgenic plant therefore got itself protected from the parasite. You see, beautiful. So this uh, um, plant, this plant is automatically getting the protection from the transgenic genes when they are transferred. So it is not, uh, the parasite is not able to kill it. So you need not apply any what is known as a different type of uh, pesticides uh, and other things. The plant, the plant itself uh, uh, when we are introducing the gene into that it is able to develop a resistance for that. The biotechnological application in agriculture. The recombinant DNA technological processes have made an immense impact in the area of health care by enabling mass production of a safe and a more effective therapeutic drugs. See? Safe and effective therapeutic drugs. Further, the recombinant therapeutics do not induce unwanted immunological responses as is a common in case of a similar products isolated from the non-human sources. That's a very interesting point. See, the most important point that you have to remember here is further the recombinant therapeutics do not induce unwanted immunological responses. See? When you just take a medicine, a tablet or a syrup or whatever it is, it is it will be having its own side effects. So unwanted immunological responses will take place in your body by the traditional medicine that you are taking for any disease. And that is minimized or that is completely avoided by when you are taking the medicine which is biotechnologically produced. At present, about 30 recombinant therapeutics have been approved for human use the world over. In India, 12 of them are presently being marketed. I think uh, a slight change I think how to make uh, biotechnological applications uh, not in agriculture. Here I am not discussing about agriculture. It is in the pharmaceutical or in the medicine. Please uh, make the change. I am sorry. We have to make the change because we are discussing about the therapeutic values of the biotechnology. So, or the heading, it's not agriculture, it is a medicine. Okay, fine. So, it is that we are continuing now. At present, 30 recombinant therapeutics have been approved for human use the world over. In India alone, 12 of these are presently being marketed. So, in these uh, therapeutic uh, values, therapeutic usage of a different medicines produced by the biotechnological process, one very important thing is what is called as an insulin. Now, this insulin, you know very well that uh, diabetes is a very, I mean, uh, prevalent disease, particularly in India. Statistics shows that one third of the Indian population is suffering from diabetes. If you just take 110 crores to be the population of India as it stands today, 30 percentage, that means roughly 33 crores, 33 crores of people are suffering from the disease. See, 33 crores is not... The number is not an easy joke. See, so many people suffering from a particular disease means how this has happened. That we are not going to discuss at this point. There is no point in discussing that. A change of lifestyle. Food habit has completely changed. We have come to a sedentary lifestyle. And the complete world has totally changed. So more and more diseases a human being we are getting. So diabetes is one such a disease. 
So in, this happens because of the insufficient uh, sufficiency in your body, insulin insufficiency. Pancreas, which is a secreting, which is responsible for uh, secreting the insulin, is not secreting the uh, minimum quantity that you need for your uh, normal lifestyle. So what happens? People started depending on the insulin from the external source. So once upon a time, what was then pigs? Animals were slaughtered, and then the pancreas was attacked, and it was ground, and then the insulin was purified, and then it was injected into the man. So people were taking it in the form of the tablets, or vials, and injections. People they were depending on that, but. How long you are going to depend on this and how many pigs you are more you are going to kill? So we had an alternative. What happened? These insulin producing genes in the human being does become defective in some people and so they have become diabetes. But these genes from a normal person they were isolated and then they were introduced into the E. coli bacterium. So these are the insulin secreting genes and when that is introduced into the human being that is able to secrete the um, insufficient insulin and then it is able to make the loss it is able to compensate the loss okay so by this we are able to overcome the problem so that's what i am going to discuss in this now insulin used for diabetes was earlier extracted from pancreas of a slaughtered cattle and Insulin from an animal source causes some patients to develop allergy and other types of reactions to the foreign protein. Chain A and chain B that are linked together by disulfide bridges. In mammals, including humans, insulin is synthesized as a pro-hormone. It is synthesized as a pro-hormone, like a pro-enzyme. The pro-hormone also needs to be processed before it becomes a fully mature and functional hormone, which contains an extra stretch called C peptide. So, a pro-hormone, if it has to become a mature functional Insulin, functional hormone, a pro-hormone, if it has to become a mature and functional hormone, it has to contain a extra stretch of c -peptide. So what happens? We will see. This C-peptide is not present in the mature insulin and is removed during the maturation into the insulin. The main challenge for production of insulin using RDNA techniques was getting insulin assembled into a mature form. So the, this is this was the main challenge for us when we were trying to produce insulin by biotechnological process. This was the main problem: how to get rid of this. This is C peptide is not present in the mature insulin. So that's the difference between the pro-enzyme, uh, um, the pro-insulin or the pro-hormone and the mature hormone, okay? So this C-peptide is not present in the mature insulin and is removed during the maturation. But how to remove it when you are biotechnologically producing it? In 1983, the problem was solved. It was solved by Eli Lilly, an American company, prepared two DNA sequences corresponding to A and B chains of human insulin and introduced them in plasmids of E. coli to produce insulin chains. Chain A and B were produced separately, extracted and combined by creating disulfide bonds to form the human insulin. So finally, we got the human insulin produced by 
an American company. They preferred it. They preferred uh, uh, two chains separately and then they combined it and then the problem was uh, solved and then today we are able to get an insulin which is a biotechnologically produced. We have got what is known as a gene therapy. The first clinical gene therapy was given, uh, given in 1990 to a four-year-old girl with a adenosine diaminase, diaminase, sorry. adenosine diaminase deficiency. So it is a deficiency syndrome. This enzyme is crucial for the immune system to function. Oh, very beautiful. So this is, this is a very, very important for the immune system. You know, the immune system is the most important system in the human body. If your immune system is not functioning properly, you will be getting all sorts of diseases, 1001 diseases you will be getting if your immune system is not working properly. Then you have to be taking, going on taking medicine for all diseases. But if your immune system is very good, you need not take any medicine. Your system is going to take care of you. So this immune system will not work for with this deficiency. What is this deficiency? Adenosine deaminase deficiency. Now this disorder is caused due to the deletion of the gene for adenosine deaminase. So it's a genetic disorder. In some children, ADA deficiency can be caused by bone marrow transplantation. In others, it can be treated by enzyme replacement therapy in which a functional ADA is given to the patient by injection. But the problem with both these approaches is that they are not completely curative. That is the problem. So, these are, both these are problems. One and two. So, in some children, they can be cured by bone marrow treatment, transplantation. In some, it could be, enzyme could be directly given, but both of them are not that much competence because they are not a completely curative. It's not able to complete, give a complete cure for the patient. So what we are doing, we are going to a biotechnological processor to find out a solution for this. As a first step it towards the gene therapy, lymphocytes from the bloods of the patient are grown in a culture outside the body. So this is the first step. So the, the, the cells are grown, lymphocytes are grown outside the body. A functional ADA, cDNA using a retroviral vector is then introduced uh, these uh, lymphocytes which are subsequently returned to the patient. So, with the help of these vectors, we are able to re I mean, uh, um, give it to the patients. However, as these cells are mortal, the patient requires a periodic infusion of uh, such genetically engineered lymphocytes. You see, here also there is a problem. So, these cells are mortal and so the, the, the treatment has to be given every now and then. But however, see, however, if the gene isolated from a bone marrow cells producing ADA is introduced, then early embryo, at an early embryonic stage, then it can be a permanent cure. So now we have solved the problem to the maximum extent. Nearly 80% of the problem is now over. See, we are slowly fighting with the problems. Personally, we are finding everywhere when we stumble, we, we are uh, trying to overcome that. And then finally, we arrive at what is called as a complete uh, total success. So in this case also, in this case of AD also, we have, we have mostly 90% or 80% we have solved the problem. Of course, a little bit improvement in these uh, technologies will be able to give a complete uh, cure to the disease. Molecular diagnosis, the presence of a pathogen, bacteria, viruses, etc. is normally suspected only when the pathogen has a produced a disease symptom. By the time the concentration of a pathogen is already very high in the body. 
However, very low concentrations of a bacteria or virus at the time when the symptoms of the disease are not yet very visible can be detected by amplification of their nucleic acid by PCR, polymerase chain reaction. So, very, very good, uh, I mean, uh, a technological improved uh, quality. See, when your pathogen is entering into your body, for some period it will be having what is known as an incubation period. The moment it is in going into your body, it will not express a disease. No, it's, it's not at all there. It will take each, each vector or each disease, each pathogen has got its own method of doing it. See, some pathogens, they express after 5 days, then 10 days. Some, some pathogens take a longer duration and then they express only after about a month's time. It all depends. So, when a pathogen has entered your body, that means you have become diseased. But the disease is not expressed because it is in the incubation stage. When it is a completely maturing, when it is a proliferating, and when it is a growing, then only the disease is expressed. But by the time when the disease is expressed and then it has come to a maximum stage, what is the use of taking the drug? So now you have got a technology for this. When it is in the incubation stage, when your disease has not matured, when the disease is not too much, even then, even at this stage, we are able to amplify, we are able to find out, we are by some technological process, which pathogen has entered, at what stage it is, how much time it will take to express the disease, all these things we are able to estimate and then be able to make a therapy or a treatment for this. So this is a, um, by what is called as a molecular diagnosis. Polymerase a chain reaction. This is now routinely used to detect HIV also in suspected AIDS patients. It's being used to detect uh, mutations in genes in suspected cancer patients too. It's a powerful technique in to identify many other genetic disorders. See polymerase, PCR, a beautiful technique. We are, I mean, this PCR technique has saved so many lives. It has brought about a revolution. You are able to detect HRV. You are able to direct the, I mean, even a very early stage, suspected AIDS patients, it is able to direct uh, I mean, mutations, I mean, um, lethal mutations, detrimental mutations, deleterious mutations, and then it is a powerful technique to identify the other genetic disorders also. So in all these cases, uh, this uh, polymerase uh, chain reaction, PCR is being nowadays used. A single cell DNA or RNA targeted with a radioactive molecule is allowed to hybridize to its complementary DNA in a clone of a cell followed by a reduction using the autoradiography. The clone having the mutated gene will hence not appear on the photographic film because the probe will not have complementary with the mutated gene. This is a technique that we are using for the PCR. Okay. Enzyme-linked uh, immunoabsorbent uh, assay, that is ELISA. This is uh, based on the principle of uh, antigen-antibody interaction. Infection of a pathogen can be detected by the presence of antigens, pro that is uh, antigen in the form of uh, proteins, like uh, proteins, etc., or by detecting the antibodies synthesized against the pathogen. So this uh, ELISA once again. The antigen antibody reaction. We are able to depend, uh, I mean, we are depending on ELISA for so many uh, I mean, investigatory procedures. The infection by a pathogen can be detected by the presence of an antigen. This antigen could be in any form and it is uh, done by means of ELISA. Now we are so, uh, turning our attention to one more area. What is called as an ethical issues. The manipulation of living organisms by the human race cannot go on any further without a regulation. Now we have the, the total life has changed. 
We are trying to modify the organisms, we are trying to modify the bacteria, we are trying, we are trying to modify the genes in the human being. So we are modulating, we are modifying the genes. And this has resulted in what is called as an ethical issues. How far it is good and how far it is bad, whether we can continue with this or where we have to stop. If this is going to proceed in this line, where it will go on the end, these are all some of the ethical issues. Going beyond the morality of a such issues, the biological significance of a such things is also important. Genetic modification of organisms can have unprecedented pre predictable results when such organisms are introduced into an ecosystem. That's a very important thing that you have to note. Unpredictable results. A yeah, scientist is um, doing some research. The bacteria is there. It is there in this environment for the past thousand years. It is there for the past thousand years. It is acclimatized in this environment. Human beings have become very friendly with that uh, bacterium. And that is also living within uh, with the human being. So it's, it is a completely, totally settled. Now, you are trying to bring a change in this uh, bacterium and then make it into what is called as A+. Plus. This A has become A plus now. You have modified it. Now, whether this, what, what, what effect this A plus will have on the human being? What effect it will have on other animals? What effect it is going to have on other plants? Only time has to tell us. So, unpredictable results may come because of these modified organisms. We don't, we are not having a clear picture about all these things. So, these are also more bad. I think the issues that we are having before us. Engineering Approval Committee, Genetic Engineering Approval Committee, GEAC. Therefore, the Indian government has a set up an organization such as a Genetic Engineering Approval Committee, which will make decisions regarding the validity of a genetically modified, I mean, a genetically modified researchers and the safety of introducing genetically modified organisms for public services. This is what I was uh, telling you just now. When you are genetically modifying an organism, how safe it is for the human being? How safe it is for the animals and plants? Not only human beings. Don't think that human beings alone is the only species living in this world. I would say out of billions of species living in this world, wow, human being is only one species. When you are releasing a genetically modified organism, it may be good for a human being, but it may be highly detrimental to other organisms, other plants, other animals. You should give due respect to the other plants and animals also. That's very, very important. It is not that you are alone living in this world. It's not like that. So, it is uh, how safe it is to release these organisms into the environment is a very important point that you have to take note of. The modification of living organisms for public services has also created problems with the patency. So, patents granted for the sale. Rice is an important food grain, the presence of which goes dates back to thousands of years in ancient Asian agricultural history. There are an estimated two Lacks, two lakhs, yes, two lakhs varieties of rice in India alone. There are two lakhs varieties of rice. Let's tell you a very, very interesting fact it is two lakhs rice varieties are there in India alone. The diversity of rice in India is one of the richest in the world. Basmati rice is distinct for its unique aroma and flavor. And 27 documented varieties of Basmati are growing in India. But you see what happens to this. There is a reference to Basmati in the ancient text, folklore, and poetry as it has been grown for centuries. In 1997, an American company got a patent rights on Basmati rice through the US patent and trademark office. This allowed the company to sell a new variety of Basmati in the United States and abroad. So now we don't have any control over 
the basmati rice which was the crop of india and of indians so now we have lost the crop such a thing should not, should not happen for any other crop please remember my dear children a new variety of basmati had actually been derived from indian farmers varieties indian basmati was crossed with semi dwarf varieties and claimed as an invention or a novelty the patent extends to the functional equivalence that's the most important they have extended the patency to the functional equivalence also so you don't have any hold over this hereafter implying that other people selling basmati rice could be restricted only by the patents bio piracy is another very important area this is the term used to refer to the use of bio resources by multinational companies and other organizations without a proper authentication or authorization from the uh, countries proper and the people concerned without a compensatory payment most of the industrialized nations are rich financially but are poor in biodiversity and the traditional knowledge that's what is called as a botanical traditional knowledge and you have got a botanical medical knowledge and a traditional medical knowledge so many areas are there in what is known as a and there is a separate area called uh, ethnobotany the study of the plants as it was understood by the people who lived about uh, thousands of years back what was uh, their knowledge about the plants that's a very interesting area in botany what's called the ethnobotany in ethnobotany we have got all these uh, things but uh, traditional knowledge this uh, traditional knowledge is the knowledge of the folklore this is the traditional knowledge of the villages this is the traditional knowledge of the tribals who are living in the mountains so we go and we get the knowledge from them without compensating properly compensating them so this is a something like a stealing this is what is called a bio piracy so got a pirated series and all you have pirates the people who are stealing while people are going in the ship okay, this is a sort of a stealing this is a sort of the theft you are stealing the knowledge you are stealing the knowledge of one country you are stealing the knowledge of a particular tribal population who are stealing the knowledge of your particular community and that you are marketing it you are selling it and you are using it for your own benefit this is what is called as a bio piracy so traditional knowledge related to the bio resources can be exploited to develop a modern applications and can also be used to save time effort and expenditure during their commercialization if you want to find out a medicine for an anti venom for a snake bite the scientific researcher today wants to wants a medicine for a snake bite how he will it will take a ton years for him to come out with a medicine definitely he has to try 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 and again and again and he has to try it with the horses or animals a human being so many trials he has to make before arriving at a particular medicine for a snake bite but this information is already known to the tribals because they are living along with the snakes what uh, i mean a treatment has to be given for which type of a snake everything is known to them so you get the information from them and then it is given some i mean uh, modify that and then it is utilized by the modern people so the traditional knowledge related to the bio resources can be exploited and then it is developed to modern applications and can be used to save to it it saves a lot of time for us it it saves a lot of effort also it saves a lot of expenditure also when you steal something from the tribals okay but you can do this no harm in that you can do that but you you give a compensation to them you take care of them and then you take it from them it's also okay so such things have to be patented there has been growing realization of this injustice inadequate compensation and benefit sharing between developed and developing countries therefore indian patents bill has been passed therefore some nations are developing laws 
to prevent such unauthorized exploitation of their bio resources and their traditional knowledge in indian parliament has recently the indian parliament has recently cleared the second amendment of the indian patent bill that takes such issues into consideration including patent terms emergency provisions and research and of developing initiative so that's a good thing that the indian parliament has done it has taken care of the 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 issue what is called as a biopiracy and then the traditional botanical knowledge which is being stolen by the people all these things have been given due weightage and importance and uh, i mean uh, if at all you are getting an information it has to be properly compensated that's what the bill says the indian parliament patents bill says okay fine so now we were able to get a very complete picture about what is called as a biotechnology and its application part of that biotechnology could be used for what purposes how best it could be used utilized for the welfare of the human being finally see everything goes only to ends up there only see we want to live a happy life we want to live a healthier life we want to live a more comfortable life and we make use of the plants the animals microorganisms everything to satisfy these needs so how best the biotechnology could be used for this purpose this is what we are doing for the past 25 or 30 years and what amount of a success we have achieved in this i have highlighted in my lecture of this one hour i think you would have been really benefited by this thank you very much very good